What I'm going to be speaking to you about today is uh, an emergent subject of great interest to the planet's diverse urbanist communities, this notion of the smart city. Uh, the talk is called Another City is Possible, Networked Urbanism from Above and Below. And the primary point I want to make to you is that when considering the intersection of networked information technology and our cities, this notion of the smart city is terribly, terribly partial and incomplete and unsatisfactory. And I'd like to explore where the ideas behind this paradigm of the smart city come from so we can understand why I feel this way and maybe perhaps convince you of that viewpoint. I want to take a look at some recent visions of the urban future, visions that are bound up in development sites on Earth, places like Mazdar in the United Arab Emirates, Songdo in the Republic of Korea, which is to say South Korea, and a very mysterious development in Portugal called Planet Valley, which has been produced and promoted primarily by an American company named Living Planet. These are a series of places on Earth. These are the canonical smart cities, the original smart cities. But if they constitute physical environments, sites, and terrains, they also constitute a discourse. Could I have these lights down a little bit? That would be really nice. They also constitute a discourse, a coherent and a contained body of thought and practice with some very, very deep valuations, priorities, and beliefs built into it. And given that I was trained as a literary theorist and a literary critic, I'd like to do a close reading of this discourse. I'd like to, do, I'd like to attempt a close reading of these sites and perhaps understand a little bit more about what those valuations, what those priorities, and what those beliefs are. We're going to be asking the following questions about these places. We're going to be asking, what are they? Where are they? For whom are they intended? By whom were they developed? And why? Why the smart city at this moment in history? Well, here's the what of things. The what is fairly straightforward. The proposition of the smart city is to embed networked informatics, which is to say digital networked information processing systems, in every object, surface, and relation of the city. So all of the structures and all of the infrastructures, all of the vehicles, all of the things that surround us in the built environment and even our relations with one another and the natural world that take place in that environment. The who of the smart city is relatively easy to figure out. There is a series of corporate, large, enterprise-scale, international actors, global names we're all familiar with, like IBM and Cisco and Siemens, as well as some smaller concerns, like this American company, Living Planet, that I've described to you. And if we're going to learn more about the what, it's important to listen to the who. It's important to listen to these enterprises as they describe specifically what they think it is that the smart city is all about. IBM describes their urban initiative as technology that synchronizes and analyzes efforts among sectors and agencies, so not among us as people or as citizens, but among sectors and agencies as they happen, giving decision makers consolidated information that helps them anticipate problems and manage growth and development in a sustainable way that minimizes disruptions and helps increase prosperity for everyone. Well, I think we can all agree that the goal of prosperity for everyone is a valid goal, an ambitious goal, but something that we can all relate to. It's that minimizes disruptions that I want you to remember, because later on in the presentation, we'll see exactly what IBM means by minimize disruptions. There are other problems with this, primarily the idea that information is being gathered solely for the use of decision makers, when after all, the very meaning of democracy is that each, and each of us in our own lives should ultimately be the decision makers with the responsibility for determining the shape of urban life. Cisco is the manufacturer of the infra internet routers that 60% of the traffic on the world's internet flows through. They obviously have a lot to be gained by a dramatic intensification of the networking and technologization of the everyday urban environment. Cisco describes their comparable effort as the seamless integration of public and private services delivered across a common network infrastructure to individuals, governments, and businesses. Well, that individuals, governments, and businesses strikes me as being about the right order of priority. But, you know, there are other issues with this as well. That seamless in particular. Any time you hear somebody use the word seamless in the technological context, I want you to put brackets around it and remember that that word is a lie. Because digital information technological networks are inherently heterogeneous. 
They are inherently seamful. They do not connect seamlessly. They cannot connect seamlessly. Anybody promising to offer you a seamless experience is lying to you. Siemens has this very aggressive definition. They describe the smart city as a place and a time several decades from now where cities will have countless autonomous, intelligently functioning IT systems that will have perfect knowledge of users' habits and energy consumption and provide optimum service. The goal of such a city is to optimally regulate and control resources by means of autonomous IT systems. Well, first of all, perfect knowledge is a phantasm. It's a fantasy. I cannot quite conceive that anybody was unwary enough to argue that there would ever be a technological system capable of having perfect knowledge of everything. But the more disturbing part about this definition is that thing about the goal. Do cities have goals? What is Prague's goal? How could anything as multi-voiced and multi-vocal and multi-sided and heterogeneous as a city ever have a single unitary goal? What is Cleveland's goal or Karachi's goal or Seoul's goal? It's nonsensical to speak of a city having goals. Living Planet, interestingly enough, describes their smart city as a complete picture of building state usage and operations, continually maintained, allowing constant, there's that word again, optimization of energy resources environment and occupant support and convenience systems. So this language should terrify us. This is a company that's capable of taking everything beautiful and meaningful and valuable about a city, everything that generates experience and memory, and thinking of it as occupant support and convenient systems, like it was some kind of air conditioning duct on a space station. This should worry us that these people are proposing to intervene in our cities. But of course, Living Planet also describes the smart city as the missing link between the real estate and technology sectors. And here, I think, finally, we're being honest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the smart city. For whom is the smart city being developed? Well, I think we can see from these definitions that it is a thoroughly technocratic vision the smart city aims on a cleared site, on a place where there was no city before, no people before, to impose an essentially optical order that is dedicated to the needs of watchfulness from above and consecrated to the prerogatives of administration. This is what IBM built for the city of Rio de Janeiro. This is the Intelligent Operations Center, a $40 million fusion center that runs all of the operations of the city of Rio de Janeiro, where all of that information is brought into one place and rendered in visualizations, which are then turned around for the exclusive use of the city's administrators. Well, anybody who knows anything about information technology knows that once you've gathered that information, you could turn around and re-offer it to the world through what is called an API, an application programming interface, at essentially zero cost. And since offering that information back out to the public would cost little or nothing, and IBM has chosen not to do it. What that suggests to me is that they don't believe that, in fact, we as members of the public ought to have access to that information. This is a similar center that Cisco built for Abu Dhabi. This is a member of the Abu Dhabi police. Cisco's ambition is to put an IP camera, an internet protocol-capable network camera, over every building entrance in the city of Abu Dhabi and have the police watching at all times. What is the why of all of this activity? Well, this screenshot ought to give us a clue. This is the back end. This is a visualization from the back end of a system called Kiviti that is developed by a French company uh, called, uh, excuse me, the, the, um, the company is called Kiviti, which in Latin means who watches. This is exactly what the smart city is all about. This is a video camera that is applying an index of 81 different metrics to each face it sees and attempting to characterize that person walking by the camera as to their age, their gender, their ethnicity, and by bouncing light off of their eyeballs and measuring the reflectivity of that light, whether or not they're paying attention to a billboard. The goal of the smart city, in one sentence, is the computational extraction of value from everyday activity. But I would argue, not merely the extraction of value, but the preservation of that value for a very small minority, not value that is shared with those of us who are generating it. Another goal of the smart city is to optimize resource utilization and, of course, to minimize disruption. It is to take those of us who constitute the multitude as a material. The smart city has no way of accounting for these very salient activities which make up so much of the meaning and culture of cities on Earth. It has no way of accounting for activities like informal housing or practices of informal mobility or the delivery of informal services. 
And if you think that these illustrations of the informal sector do not apply to Prague, you may be mistaken. The World Bank acknowledges that informal economic activities were responsible for something like 30% of GDP worldwide through the years 1999 to 2007. So we ought to be concerned about a model of economic activity that does not account for the informal sector at all. The smart city has no way of accounting for these other very salient activities. These that we recognize from all over the world, from Tahrir Square to Madrid to Zuccotti Square to a very small version of Occupy in Dublin, to the protests that took place in Montreal, to those that took place in Taksim Square, in Istanbul, and in Sao Paulo. As a matter of fact, the smart city conceives of the practice of democracy as disruption. That is precisely what IBM means when they say minimize disruptions. They mean minimizing the practice of democracy. Lest you think that I'm simply an embittered leftist academic saying this, I want you to realize that this is exactly what IBM themselves say explicitly in their developer guidelines for the Intelligent Operation System Manual. In that manual, they have questions like this. Which streets will require the most troops, armed, militarized police, to suppress incidents of democracy? These are the police in question. This is the Special Operations Police Battalion of Rio de Janeiro, a police force that's been cited by Amnesty International with multiple violations of human rights, abuses, and civil liberties. This is the smart city. What subjectivity is the smart city intended to reproduce? What vision of everyday life is encompassed by it? Well, in the smart city, in the marketing materials that these vendors offer us, we see a very clear and consistent vision of what everyday life in the smart city is to be like. It is to be a lifestyle of consumption, convenience, and security. But it is a lifestyle of consumption, convenience, and security only for a very few, and a permanent state of exception for everyone else. Take, for example, Mazdar in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi is a place where 79.6% of the population and a full 90% of the labor force are foreign guest workers whose passports are taken from them upon arrival who have effectively no rights at all, neither civil rights nor human rights, who are subject to every kind of abuse. So when you see a picture like this one of Mazdar City, you should remember that the people who built it, and again, 79.6% of the population, live in places like this. Shipping containers, unsheltered from the desert sun, surrounded by razor wire and fences and armed private security guards. It's also incontrovertible that the smart city in its planning practices, in its physical provision for the built environment, recapitulates some astonishingly prominent blunders of the 20th century, things that those of us who are architects or urban planners all learned about in our first year of school. What were these blunders of high modernist urban planning in the 20th century? Well, these were cities that were built on cleared greenfield sites. Remember, Le Corbusier, the prime architect of high modernism in the 20th century, is somebody who is capable of looking at Paris and thinking of it as little more than a collection of donkey's paths that ought to be swept away. The terrain ought to be cleared so we could build something of value upon that land. These were places where residence was segregated from commerce, which was segregated from industry, and all of these things were segregated from the systems of circulation that bind the city together. These were places, ultimately, they were about a model of optical clarity consecrated to the needs of administration and with no way of accounting for informality. And if this is starting to sound familiar, well, there's that old line about those who forget history being condemned to repeat it, and that is precisely what we are doing. Consider the primary high modernist failures of planning of the 20th century, places like Brasilia, clearly designed in the shape of a raptor, a bird of prey, or Chandigarh in India. Both of these administrative centers consecrated to the needs of their administrators with rigorous functional segregation, and both of them utter failures both of them notorious failures, that if the designers of the smart city knew anything about the history of 20th century urbanism, they would be taking great pains to avoid. Instead, in places like Mazdar and Songdo and Planet Valley in Portugal, the designers of the smart city are recapitulating these precise errors, making these same blunders over and over and over again. But that's not even my real problem with the smart city. The real problem with the smart city is that as a discourse, it has nothing to do with cities. It treats our urban environments as terrain or a market. It speaks of these bizarre ideas like the fact that a city might have a goal or that everything 
that gives meaning and value and texture and resonance to our lives might simply be an occupant support and convenience system. Ladies and gentlemen, I remind you, this is the smart city, something that is utterly predicated on a neoliberal political economy, something that is disturbingly consonant with the exercise of authoritarianism and control from the top down, something that is evacuated of content, evacuated of history, evacuated of politics, I would argue to you, evacuated of urbanity itself. But the good thing about its being a discourse and a rhetorical production is that if it is only that, it is not an inevitability. It is just one selection from the sheaf of techno-social possibilities that are available to us. What I'm, I'm interested in and what I, ought, what I believe that we ought to be building together is not a smart city at all, but a conscious, aware and loving practice of networked urbanism, which is to say that of the great 20th century urbanists, my model is not this man, is not Le Corbusier, it is this woman, Jane Jacobs, in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, written in 1961. And if I ask myself what it is that we should be doing with emerging technologies in the urban environments of the planet, my recourse is to this question, what would Jane Jacobs do? I believe that she would be interested in systems that underwrite the city's existing intelligence, the city's existing intelligence, which is to say our collective intelligence, our existing competence for being urban people in urban places, everything that we know about how to live and give meaning to the city. Jane Jacobs would argue that order arises spontaneously from below when it is allowed to, in a way and in a process that takes advantage of all that messy history, precisely. The history of a place that both Le Corbusier and the architects of the smart city would sweep aside entirely. She would say that order is something built up over time by an infinity of small acts. And that is why when we speak about data-driven urbanism or networked cities, I think we need to ask ourselves questions about provenance, data. You know, I literally heard an IBM senior data scientist say to me once, the data is the data, neutral, objective, unimpeachable, nonsense. Nonsense. How could somebody rise to the position of a senior data scientist and believe that? The data is never just the data. There is no such thing as raw data. Somebody made the data. So if we are going to design smart cities that truly respond to the conditions of our lives, we need to be asking ourselves, who made that data? Who gathered it? How can we as citizens gain access to it? And what can we as communities, as collectives, and as individuals do with it? Most importantly of all, we need to be asking, what does this work make of us? We need to have a different set of values guiding our work. Now, I have tried to make the values that are inscribed in the smart city explicit, so I think it's only fair that I be explicit about the set of values that I bring to my work, and these are my values. I believe that in setting out to design the technolo technologized cities of the 21st century, we must ensure that where the public generates data, it has meaningful access to and ownership of that data. I believe we ought to be resisting concentrations and asymmetries of network-derived power knowledge. I believe that we ought to be preventing capture of the commons by private interest, and above all, I believe that we need to inscribe a robust conception of the right to the city in all of the city's networked objects, services, and relations. If there is such a thing as the smart city, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we can do better. Much, much better. If anything I've said has piqued your interest, whether you agree with it or very strongly disagree with it, I encourage you to read more in the pamphlet I published last year, perhaps unsurprisingly entitled Against the Smart City. And I thank you very, very much for your time, your attention, your voices. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We have a few minutes. I Do we have think time for some Q&A? I think... You were really fast, and this, we really applaud your, this, the speed and the brevity of the presentation. So I think we can take one or two questions very quickly. Are there any questions? I have a question. I am working with a, a person in New York. His name is Daniel Latour, and he has been talking about the same issues. And he's coining the phrase, wise city. Yeah. Uh, well, I would be interested in your comment on that. Well, I think that that's an ambition that I share. I believe that, uh, I don't think there's any such thing as smart, and I couldn't care less about smart. I don't know what smart is. Um, I think that 
if we are interested in developing cities, we ought to be thinking about justice. We ought to be thinking about justice, and we ought to have the wisdom and the maturity to design contexts that produce, actively produce justice, the circumstances and the conditions that generate it. The trouble is, is that wisdom, well, it's a fairly subjective term. I mean, I like to think that my approach is inherently wiser, but you've heard from people like Ed Glazer, who obviously believe diametrically opposed things. So where I differ from Dan is in not wanting to have the arrogance necessarily to say that my approach is wiser. Do I believe it is? Of course I do. But I would never insist on that. I think we, each of us have our own wisdom. This is part of what wisdom is, is understanding that life is a process of maturation and um, trying to have a little bit of humility about what it is that we design. I do think we can be a little bit more, I would never use the word objective, but I think that just and justice are ideas that may be a little bit easier to arrive at some kind of rough consensus about than wisdom. I hope that's a useful answer. Do you have time for maybe one or two more questions? Yeah, hello. Ooh, sparkling water, it's good. I actually don't have a question, I have a more of a comment. Um, I agree. I, I'd actually like to, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we have such limited yeah. time, I would like to, if you have a question. I would also say questions only, okay. please. Okay, so I turn it in a question. Um, the thing is, I, do you think, or do you agree with, this, with the possibility that the smart cities concept already um, encompasses more things than you basically presented? I'm mentioning, or I'm thinking about, some cities that make public um, real-time data, for example, pollution levels and, and energy consumption. Yeah. So yeah. would you say that already, would you kind of enlarge your smart city I personally definition? think the language of the smart city is so toxic and is so polluted at source that those, those ambitions, while they may be meaningful and valuable, um, I, I just, I have no patience for this concept of the smart city. The reason is that even those things that you mentioned are primarily led by technology and technological capabilities. If we have cheap sensors that can measure things, then we put those sensors up. But we haven't asked from the beginning, was that actually a concern of any citizen? Or is this the proper way to go about measuring it? Or might there be other ways of measuring it? I know a community activist in London who um, actually, when a, a similar sensorization of her environment was proposed, said, no, let's take that money instead and hire out-of-work people to go door-to-door -door gathering that information. That's exactly what I mean about where did this data come from, who made it. Because the process of making the data ourselves may teach us things that slapping a sensor on a wall will never. I, I, I'm resistant to the notion, wherever it appears, whether inside the smart city context or outside of it, in other contexts like the quantified self, I'm very resistant to the notion that the things that are salient and meaningful in life are those things that can be measured. I happen to believe that just about everything that produces meaning and value in our lives, by definition, cannot be measured. So I'm interested in making those measurements. I'm interested in using them as pretexts for political conversations, for dissensus and discourse and deliberation. But I don't think those are a solution to the problems that face us in any city on Earth. And I think that the time, effort, investment, and energy that goes into those things might very possibly be better spent on working directly with people as communities and individuals to raise our competence for living in the city. That's just my opinion. Thanks, Adam. So that's it. Yeah, thank Cheers. you so much. <laughs>